Welcome to the Best Business Podcast, the podcast for established marketers, entrepreneurs, and CEOs, the ones who want to join me in my mission to create 200 new multimillionaires who solve world problems with entrepreneurship. If that's you, then this podcast was created to give you access to the tools, training, strategies, and tactics you need to achieve multiple seven-figure profits as soon as possible. This world needs the best business you can build, so please get ready, open your mind, believe you can do this, and let's build a better world together for future generations. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we are joined by my friend and a returning guest, Mitch Russo. And for those of you who don't know, Mitch first started his public life as the lead guitarist of a rock band called Absolutely Free. Since then, Mitch has been quite productive. First, he built a real estate portfolio in Massachusetts and used the working capital for his next venture. In 1985, Mitch co-founded Time Slips Corp, which grew to become the largest time-tracking software company in the world. In 1994, Time Slips was sold to Sage PLC, and while at Sage, Mitch went on to run all of Sage US as Chief Operating Officer, a division with 300 people and a market cap uh, in excess of $100 million US. Mitch was nominated Inc. Magazine's Entrepreneur of the Year in 89 and 91 and won Best Entrepreneur in 1989 by the National Association of Legal Vendors. Mitch joined the longtime friend Chet Holmes as president and later to join forces with Tony Robbins, and together they created Business Breakthroughs International, a company serving thousands of businesses a year with coaching, consulting, and training services. Mitch was the president and CEO of Business Breakthroughs. After the early and unfortunate death of Chet, Mitch left Business Breakthroughs to help others build their business as a consultant specializing in building certified consulting and coaching organizations working with call centers with large volume lead flow, helping coaching organizations scale, essentially. In 2015, Mitch published The Invisible Organization, the CEO's guide to building a fully virtual organization. And now Mitch is building certification and licensing programs companies use to generate insane profits while exploding their sales. An avid travel and landscape photographer, Mitch's work won first prize with the Sierra Club in 1994 and more recently was published in Jet Gala magazine with a two-page spread. I love his posts on Facebook. I always click like whenever I see him. And Mitch is always checking for a full moon in Iceland and has been known to disappear in a moment's notice. If you, Again, if you follow him, you know why. His photographs are beautiful. And you can see some of them at www.mitchrussotravels. That's M I T C H. R-U-S-S-O, travels.com. His consultant business website is at mitchrusso.com, and his certification program is mypowertribe.com. Mitch, thank you so much for joining me again. I always appreciate your time and love our conversations. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Daryl, and thank you again for inviting me on the podcast. It's a, It's been such a whirlwind of activity these last few years. I'm glad that we finally have a chance to catch up a little bit. Right. Yeah. No, it's been a long time coming. I mean, we catch up every now and then, I guess, in, in between. But yep. I'm kind of excited to hear about what you got going on. I kind of gave a bit of your background before, and obviously they're in the intro. But for some of these people, they may not have heard our first interview. Those of you listening, if you enjoy this, I highly recommend you go and find our first interview we did with Mitch. It's great content. He's a ton of value to share. But Mitch, can you maybe talk a bit about kind of, I guess, what a lot of people listening to this might be most interested in is kind of what you learned in the early days like i guess can you share a bit of your your story i mean i gave the high level of it but with time slips what were some of the challenges and things that you learned coming through that building that business and again with business breakthroughs i think a lot of people listening to this having heard your credentials they might want to know kind of like i guess the different evolutions that you've had as a business owner from your early career to the middle of your career to, to where we are today if that makes sense of course of course yeah i could tell that story and I have several stories around all of the experiences, which I think are valuable because we all go through these things. And more importantly, we have the feelings that go with it, no matter what level we are. So whether we're an entrepreneur just starting out and we have a fear of failure or we have a fear of not being good enough. I mean, all of us have those feelings from different at different times in our life and at different stages of our life. So while the numbers may be bigger for some people, the feelings are about the same. And mm. and I wanted to talk about that because what I've discovered at, at now at the age that I am and having done as many interesting things that I've done, what I found is that the feelings actually matter the least. 
And what I mean by that is that it we all feel sometimes inadequate. We all feel afraid to try things. We all fear what it will, you know, what other people will say and how we will look in the eyes of others. And if I could tell you from the age, here I am, I'm 62 years old. I've been in business on and off for 40 years. I've run some very large companies. And I got to tell you that the biggest things that you're afraid of are meaningless. Mm. And, and it's so important for entrepreneurs to understand that the only thing that matters is taking measured action and doing things to test and retest your ideas and your concepts. And everything in life is a matter of trial and error. So those are the big lessons. Mm, you know? mm, 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 mm. I love that. I love that so much because I noticed that that's something that I, for me, at least with productivity, I know once I started measuring my productivity, I became a big fan of Pomodoro's. But when I first started that, I noticed that some days I would feel so productive and other days I would feel like, you know, crummy and not so productive. But when I actually measured it, I realized that how I felt about the day often had no correlation with how productive. I might have had a great day, felt great. But when I looked on paper, I realized I got nothing done, had a crummy day and been super productive. And the opposite, right? It's not that I had to feel crummy to be productive. But I just love that you said that, that it's really about taking measured actions to just kind of commit to something small, tangible, like a test you know, and, and kind of be playful with it. I think that's a, a great way to approach business. That's right. You know, and, and again, to support that thought, that's how everybody starts. That if you look at, you know, if you watch Shark Tank and you see all these rich guys sitting around judging all these entrepreneurs, well, they got rich by trying something that no one believed they would be successful at doing. So the typical process that people go through is they first try something and everybody laughs. Then they start to become successful and no one believes it. Then when they're really successful, everyone is amazed and praises them. So understand that the 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 normalcy, which is us most most of the population, sort of staying in the groove that they're in and not doing a lot, that doesn't apply to entrepreneurs. Uh-huh. We don't get to you see. Right. <laughs> we need to push. We need to always be moving we need to be basically blazing frontiers in our own world the way we do so that's why you see me and that again at this age and at my level of success i am still trying new things almost every day and Mm. some of them are going to fail maybe most of them will fail but the ones that don't will succeed because i tried not because i thought about it hoped about it wished i did and wrote about it but never did yeah, you know what I mean, oh, I I fully agree. I feel like success is like a beast you got to feed with a certain amount of failure. I have a I have a favorite quote about success. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna change the language, but it's like success is like pregnancy. Everyone congratulates you, but nobody really knows how many times you got screwed to achieve it. You know, so <laughs> it's it's <laughs> and I think that's so true. You know, all these overnight yeah. all these overnight successes took them ten years and whatever, but it's. There's still little victories along the way, and like you said, it's it's just about taking measured. What would you say? You said taking measured action, and just that's right. Yeah. Can you give some examples of some measured action? I mean, you've been part of some very large companies, like you said, and and helped companies grow and scale sales. Getting clients is often a really difficult thing for businesses, as well as scaling sales. Can you talk about those two topics a little bit, or how you've learned to approach those? Yes. In fact, it's funny because I just got off the phone with one of my clients and we had almost this identical conversation. So client comes to me and shows me this big picture of what they want to do. And, the, you know, the, the end numbers are in the millions. And I said, well, let's why don't, why don't we start with selling something? Why don't we take one of your lowest cost services and why don't we give it away for free or make it so cheap that it's irresistible? <clears throat> Let people try it out and let's build a list. Let's build a community. And then once people love what they got from you, let's offer them something that costs a little bit more and then a little bit more and build an, an, an ascension plan inside your own company by simply offering small things that they could do to get b- better and better at the skills that you're trying to teach them. Mm. So realistically, what it comes down to when I say measured actions is, you know, I wouldn't go and empty your bank account on a Facebook ad campaign. Mm-hmm. Not yet. 
you know, spend a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, God forbid, <laughs> and test. Just test, test, test. A measured action. Spend, you know, take the same ad, create five variations, spend a hundred dollars on each variation, and measure. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. I love how you talked about the ascension part, the building a list and community as well, because I think that that's an important thing, because if you if someone's listening to this and you don't know where to go and reach and, and send a message to 100 ideal prospects or even a thousand ideal prospects, then that's your actual problem, right? Because you might have the best sales presentation in the world, but if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? If you have the best presentation, the best product, and you don't know where to get in front of your customers, right? So I think that that's an actual real powerful thing. So I really loved how you said that. And a good way to figure out where that community is, is to build a list. To, like you said, to offer something for super cheap or for free even just to see how many people are out there. And that way you have that place to go and talk to those people. So does that, that's right. is that really, I guess that's a huge part, no matter whether it's a big company, a hundred million, or it's a small person doing, just trying to reach six figures or someone that's a seven figure business is the, are the principles the same or businesses different? Okay. So, well, you know that lots of people do this all the time, particularly with things like Facebook ads. Let me tell you a story about one of my clients, Tony Robbins. So I'm working with Tony right now and I'm building his radio campaign for the coming, the winter campaign as we're calling it. And I mean, as successful as Tony Robbins is, I mean, he has $5 billion of businesses that he controls. He's, I think, active in 12 of them. And to even at this stage in his life, he still takes the time to try new things. So he and I came up with an idea. I said, hey, Tony, let's try it. So we went to the studio and we recorded a, a number of spots. And he said, OK, Mitch, you got what you need. Here's your budget. Let me know what happens. So I went back to the engineering team and we, we, we crafted these beautiful ads with Tony Robbins. And now we're going to run them on radio to see what happens next. Mm. Now, I didn't, didn't say that we created one spot and I didn't say we're going to blow a billion dollars on a one spot radio campaign. I said we, we built several spots and we're testing them with a small amount of money. So no matter what level or stage your business is in, this element of taking measured action and testing before you you basically roll it out is the only way to go. And mm -hmm. even Tony Robbins to this day does that with small amounts of money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Test small, roll out big fast. I love that. Yep. And the other thing that you're talking about, which I beat the drum on on the show a lot, is none of this has been about SEO or – I mean obviously I have a podcast. And I believe in content marketing. But everything you've mentioned is about paid advertising. Is is paid advertising – I don't want to ask a leading question, but I, how, how important is paid advertising to being – having like an, a business that, that can weather the storms? I mean – can you just speak to that? And I don't, again, I don't want to try to make that a leading question in any way, but I just would like to know your honest, sincere opinions of it. Sure. So, so realistically, it depends who you are. It's, you know, it's kind of that simple. If, if you have a, an avid list of 200,000 fans who you are communicating with on a regular basis, and I mean like regular, like at least once a week or more, then that is a component of a overarching strategy of growing a business. Advertising is a part of that strategy too. But if you have a very active social media platform, if you have hundreds of thousands of people who read your tweets or see your posts on Facebook or, or follow you on LinkedIn, then advertising will play a smaller role in your overall growth. And I even know some companies who started out because they didn't have a penny to spend on advertising, decided to go all in on building their tribe. Mm. And it's in doing so that later in life, when they finally do have money, they can use it to leverage the existing tribe that they've built with a small amount of very measured action to advertising, things mm. that they can test. Mm, 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 so mm. I think advertising is part of a big picture. It's never the thing. And by the way, as you know, I just talked about radio. You just talked about Facebook. There are hundreds of ways to yes. advertise. When I, grew, I grew a software company by sending nearly 2.5 million pieces of direct mail a year. 
And I, there was no such thing as the internet. I know I'm dating myself. <laughs> there was, there, I mean, realistically, there was no email, no Facebook, no, no internet. It was just basically the mail and the phone. And that was it. And right. that's what you get it. What you did back then, that's what you had to do, and that's what we did. But, you know, and you say you date yourself, but to be honest, I think there's a ton of wisdom and value in that because it's almost like today's day and age, because it's so easy, it's so easy to put garbage out as well. When you have to pay to drop letters in the mail, when you have to pick up the phone and talk to real people yourself versus just make a video and put it online and not have to look at their faces, you know what I mean, or see the reaction or see them click away, like that, I feel like to a certain extent that that is, it's almost like they say some of the best salespeople in the world cut their teeth going door to door, right? Because there's that face to face pressure. The people really just want to sit back down and read their book or watch your TV show. So right, you have that time, you got five seconds, 15 seconds to get, you know, and every second they're waiting to shut that door in your face. You know, that's just such a, and then, so even when you mentioned that, I think there's just such wisdom that comes from that experience itself. Again, you're writing a check to put a hundred thousand letters in the mail. You know, you're going to be really sure that that letter, you know what I mean? That it's so, you talked about spending a hundred bucks or a thousand dollars on Facebook ads. People like, eh, whatever, but you're going to put even like what? A thousand letters in the mail. I mean, that's, that's going to be more than a thousand dollars. Like, you know, you gotta, there's just more clarity, more like, 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 what am I doing? What am I going to put in front of people when you go through that? So anyways, I just want to emphasize, cause you said dating yourself, but I think it's, I think there's a lot of wisdom that comes with that, that I think uh, as I get older, I understand why youth is wasted on the young because there's just in yeah. today's day and age, that can be a real asset. There's so many marketers that are online that they're just afraid to pick up the phone, talk to their customer. They're afraid to, you know, like get on stage and try to sell to a room of five people, 15, 30 people. They'd rather just do record right. a video and, and send the link to people, you know, but that feedback you get. So. Well, you're you're so right, and I'll tell you a quick story about about having gotten to the point where I was generating that where I was dropping two and a half million pieces of direct mail a year. So I had tried direct mail, just like today people try Facebook, and I completely failed. So I went to somebody in the industry and I said to them, "Hey, uh, you guys are dropping like oh my goodness, you, you're flooding the the world with junk mail, and it's working like crazy for you." How are you doing it? And they said to me, and this guy, a friend of mine, CEO of the same company that has been doing this, said, you got to speak to my friend Prue Razor. And that was the guy's name, a weird name. So I call him up and I say, yes, hi, I have a referral here about you and, and you helped my friend and his software company go into the direct mail business. Can you help me? And he comes up to my office and sits down with me and he takes a look at what I'm doing and he lays out a program that... I then realized why my friend was so successful. So Prue Razor sits down and on my conference room table and literally lays out a map of what it took to become successful in direct mail for my friend, Al my friend who runs Alpha Software. So I take a look at this thing and I said, well, Prue, how long is this going to take? And he said, well, if we're lucky, it'll take six months. And if, you know, if it takes about the average time, probably nine. I said, you mean nine months in testing alone? He goes, absolutely. We test the headline. We test the font. We test the color. We test the envelope. We test the placement of the headline on the envelope. We test whether the envelope has a window or it doesn't have a window. We test the, the bang flap, as it's called. We test every single element before we put any real money into doing this. And we test no more than 5,000 names at a time. So I said to him, well, you know, I'm in this to play the long game. Let's get started. So as we're at this point, you know, it's like month three and I'm getting an really anxious. <laughs> I just want to get going here, you know. And so we're getting some good results. And I said to Prue, I said, hey, could we go now because we got some good results? He goes, no, we can't go now because we don't know if these are bad results or good results because we have nothing to compare them to yet. So on and on we went month after month, testing, testing, testing. And all the while what's happening behind the scenes is that I had been approached by Sage about buying my company. And one of the things that I had negotiated when I sold my company was the right to have an unlimited marketing budget after they bought me. And because the reason I wanted that was because I was about to receive a percentage, a very, very, very large percentage 
of every dollar I generated in my years with Sage. So uh-huh. it was to my best interest to spend a lot of money in marketing. Right. Well, we we closed the deal for me to sell my company the same week we were done testing nine months of email offers to various lists all over the all over the country. Email so you or can email imagine, or snail mail? Snail mail. Sorry, okay. Because you said, you said email mail. offers. <laughs> sorry, keep going. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, right. Glad you caught it. That was snail mail. Yeah. So I sold the company. I ended up moving to Dallas, Texas. And the first thing I did is I literally printed a batch of 200,000 letters. And, you know, the, the president of the other company says to me, he goes, hey, I know I said you have an unlimited budget, but are you sure about what you're doing? I said, <laughs> absolutely, I'm sure. And that started what turned into be a basically a 200% growth cycle. So having done those measured steps, that careful testing, in by inch, step by step, we were able to get to the point that we had the confidence and then finally the results. And we're able to literally open up the floodgates and start blasting out, in, in effect, uh, over almost, I'd say over 200,000 direct letters per month. And that grew our sales dramatically. I love that. So that's what I meant by testing. Yeah, I love I love that so much. I think there's this – so people listening to this may want to go back and listen to that again because that is extremely – that's a value bomb. We could wrap up this interview right now. Like, boom, done. That's a wrap. Thank you, everyone. And – I, you know, I want to take this moment because what you said, it's so powerful. One of the most empowerful things for me, having studied from a lot of different people that are really great at marketing, Gary Halbert is a name that comes up again and again. And one of the most powerful things that helped me early in my career was this, uh, was a seven step kind of checklist I got from him about being successful in marketing. Mm-hmm. And I just translated it to online. And it, I think it works anything. It works with what you're going to do with radio, it work with television, work with newspaper ads. And first is you start with your hot market, right? Or your mailing list or your, your target interest group or whatever. Then you find or create a product, right? Obviously, you want something where the margins are very favorable. Uh, some people say 10 to 1. Some people say 20 to 1. Depends who you talk to. Depends what industry you're in, but you want to try and find something that has good margins. Then you would create a promotion that describes your product or service and the benefits of owning it, right? Then you would make your test mailing, which is like Mitch said, then it was 5,000 names at a time. You can call this online web visitors. That can be, uh, you know, 1,000 or 5,000 web visitors. Again, it comes down to, I think, a lot of people trying to be successful in business, not like being afraid of shining the spotlight on what they're doing and, and even spending that money, right? Because they say it does take money to make money. That's you kind of almost need something going to be able to do that. Right. And get, and get tangible data. That's what you're buying is data in the beginning. And then once you've got your, your, your tests done, you analyze your results and the results are good. Then you get another 20,000, a hundred thousand more letters in the mail or visitors or whatever. And if results are still good, start rolling out, taking care of business. Mitch, that's literally what you just talked about doing over a nine month period, essentially till you got something that was like, almost like ironclad and it just, you did it so well. And then you were in this great position. Someone else would foot the bill for you to drive your commission through the roof using what you tested exactly. and and it's not and the thing is even though you're testing you're getting better at as you do it right it's like juggling like if you're testing juggling i mean if we just put this into minutes you test you know a thousand minutes of juggling it's not like you're going to suck as much in the be- at, you know at the end of a thousand minutes as the beginning like you're getting better as you go i mean by your ninth month it was highly profitable but you're probably already making money around month three four or five you know and there you're you're probably starting to see something where it's not an expense to you anymore. Is that, is that fair to say? Well, again, you know, it was funny because it was up and down, like, like by the third, fourth month, you know, we had a couple of lists that were doing fantastic, Uh but then the following month we tried different lists and and a different offer and we were back down again. Uh So, but we had set the money aside for testing. So we had expected that we would, you know, if, if any mailing broke broke even, it would be like a party because we didn't even expect for that to happen. So we knew in advance we were spending money. The other thing was, and I just want to make it clear, we I did not write those letters. We hired a professional out of in fact it was right. one of Gary Halbert's disciples to oh, wow. to 
write that that long form sales letter. Mm -hmm. So letter was created by a professional. The mail, the whole mailing process was orchestrated by a professional. All the artwork was done by a pro. And really all we were doing was we were leveraging the resources of other great people, bringing them to our table to get the work we needed done. And in the end, it worked out fantastic. That's awesome. That's so awesome. And that's and that's with your original software company that was time slip. So and obviously you worked with business breakthroughs. You've been sharing some of the insights that you learned from there. Uh, quickly, before we transfer into some of the newer stuff that you're doing, what were some of the biggest yeah. mistakes in business breakthrough? You're dealing with that. You're being you're working with Chet Holmes and Tony Robbins to I mean, obviously, you've accomplished a ton on your own. You're also working with these two guys who are also known for great accomplishments. You have three great minds put together helping thousands of business owner business owners what are kind of like the top three to five mistakes you feel that people get tripped up over in, in building and growing a business you mentioned one the the take measured action i mean that sounds like that's the most important one are there others well yeah see the, we have a bunch of different personalities when in a, in a room like that you know you put chet myself and tony in a room and you know out of the respect for each other we're certainly going to listen but you know, you have different perspectives on things. And I'll give you an example where that really tripped us up. Hmm. So instinctively, I personally knew that <clears throat> there was a point in our marketing cycle where we needed to transition to online. We had been doing almost exclusively radio as a way, radio and live events as a way of getting new clients. But we then decided that we wanted to go online. And what ended up happening was that there were people in the in the room that were such perfectionists <clears throat> that we were not even taking those measured actions. So mm. everything had to be so perfect that we finally launched and it was already too late. Mm. And you know, and any small changes now would cycle a whole week or more to get done and and it was very difficult. So I I think part of what we tripped up tripped over was the fact that when we were trying something new to us, and remember, back in 2008, marketing online was still pretty new. Mm -hmm. And there weren't any, you know, I didn't know many gurus out there who were truth, truly being successful at marketing online back then. Right. And so we kind of had to start from scratch on our own. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to quickly iterate. I wanted to try this. I wanted to try this. I wanted to try this. And there were other people who said, no, if it's going out with, you know, with the name Chet Holmes and Tony Robbins, it has to be perfect the first time. And so I think that deprived us, that, that slowed us down and it allowed us, it prevented us from succeeding a lot faster than I thought we could have. Mm. So, you know, that's, that's one example. The other thing is, is that even in big businesses, even with smart people, people quit too soon. I notice this all the time, and I even see it sometimes in myself, that instinct that says, ah, I tried it, uh, it's just not going to work, and mm -hmm. give it up. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example. And again, it comes back to stuff that I did while I was with Tony and Chet, is that we were testing this thing called um, an assessment. And we were selling the assessment, I can't remember what the price was, I think it was a couple of thousand dollars. And the first time we offered it, it frankly got three takers, very small number of people said yes. And uh, at that point, we tried one or two other things and it still wasn't working. And I would say that the consensus was, let's just move on to something else. And instead, what we decided, what I decided to do is I say, no, 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 we're not done testing yet. And we went back, <laughs> changed the offer again and changed it again until we finally found the absolute winning offer. And it took Longer than everybody expected. It pissed off everybody in the company because <laughs> I would not give up. And then in the end, we were at a, almost a 94% close rate when we finally got it right. That's awesome. That's the power of, of sticking with something. And, and I think I even may have mentioned it in my last podcast. You really do not fail until you voluntarily give up. Yep. It's that simple. Yep. Everything else is a test. That's right. Thomas Edison said That's that. That's right. He said he, what, he had 20,000 failed experiments. He said, I didn't figure out how to make a light bulb. I just ran out of wrong things to do. <laughs> That's right. 
That's right. Love that. Exactly. That's how he came upon Tungsten as the uh, as the element for a light bulb filament. So we have fail fast, don't quit, take measured action. I guess test small, scale big fast. Anything else? Uh, enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> yes. Because, let me tell you, when you scale big fast and it works, because you've tested and you that means you deserve it. You know, when you throw out a Facebook ad and spend 200 bucks here and there and you go, oh, you know what, I'll try this. Yeah, I'll try that. And it hits. Well, you got lucky, but you did not know what you did yeah. that got you that luck. I mean, it could be any one of the things that you just don't realize. However, when you take the approach of let's test this, let's test this, let's test this, till finally, when you get lucky the next time, you knew what it was that got you there and you could repeat it. That's yeah. the best part. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I love this. I'm I hope the listeners are taking notes because I've got like three pages already. I mean I love I love this stuff. So so those are some of the biggest lessons you've taken from that. And now what are you doing, Mitch? Now you've got this power tribes thing. Mypowertribe.com, yep. correct? Yep. I love correct. this. I correct. love this. So this is for people that have already kind of figured that out. They've kind of gotten past the million dollar mark. And they're they're flatlining or they're trying to figure out new ways to kind of scale new income streams. And that's kind of where you step in. Exactly. So I'll tell you a quick story about how I how I came to all of this. Okay. And it goes back to the time slips days. So I had a software company, as you know, and I was selling software. And at one point, the company was very successful early on. We were we were starting to show real signs of success in about 18 months. And the success that we were experiencing was actually starting to cause some problems. We were selling more software than we could support. Mm. And that meant that now, I mean, as fast as I could hire tech support people, it didn't matter because we were still selling more software and the hold times were too high. So we were working on that from two perspectives. We were trying to make the software easier and easier to use. But at the same time, we knew that we needed to figure out a way to support a lot more people. And it was a complete accident in the, how I discovered this whole concept. And here's how the accident happened. One of my customers, and by the way, my software only sold for $99 or $199. But one of my customers who was important to me because she ran the technology division of the, of the California Bar Association. Mm -hmm. And so she was important. And she happened to call and say, you know what? Your software is crashing my computer and I don't want anything to do with this. And you better come here and fix it right away. And I thought to myself, well, oh, my goodness, I, I, I got to send somebody out there right away to help her, even though the software was, you know, like one hundred dollars. It doesn't matter. She's an important person. So be before I sent somebody out there, I had this thought. I said, well, maybe there's somebody in the area I could ask to help me. So I remembered that there was an office in Los Angeles where the the office administrator was pretty darn sharp and she had come over to talk to me at a live event and I remember her. So I called her on the phone and I said, I have a favor to ask. Do you think you would mind going over to this person's office and helping her with her software? And if you do it, I'll, you know, I'll pay you some money, whatever it takes. And she said, oh, no, Mitch, for you, I would be happy to. I'd be thrilled to. I love your company. I love your software. And I said, oh, thank you so much. And now, of course, I sent her over there and I'm like waiting every minute. I'm checking my watch to see, is she, you know, how come she's not calling? What's going on? You know, have all this stuff on the line. Maybe it was a bad idea. Maybe I should have just sent my lead tech out there. I didn't know what to do. Finally, four hours later, the phone rings and it's her. And I said, tell me, how'd it go? How'd it go? And she goes, oh, she's fine. All we had to do was reinstall and re-index the database. and Everything is fine. And I took a deep sigh of relief and I said, oh, Thank you so much, Ann. I really appreciate it. And then she said, you know what the best part was? I said, no, what? She said, your client gave me a fresh, crisp $100 bill as a mm. thank you. And I said, oh, my God, that was so generous of her. Uh, you know, I'm so glad to hear it. And then she said the words that changed my life. She said, and if there's anybody else who needs my help, you just let me know. Mm. And the light bulb went off. Uh -huh. I said to myself, oh, my goodness, you maybe there are more clients out there who would like to help other clients 
who aren't doing as well with the software. Maybe I could figure out a way to sort of test them up front and see if they're capable of supporting my other clients. Mm. And that is the beginning of the Time Slip Certified Consultant Program that grew into 350 certified consultants all over the country. Now, think about this. We're a tiny little software company yep. in Massachusetts, and we're in a very competitive marketplace. We're in the legal industry, and there are many big companies in the legal industry. And and we really you know, have started to gain a little bit of popularity, and that's great. But, I mean, how do you create a world-class organization? You create a world-class organization by, besides getting a lot of customers, by having a national presence. Right. Well, how is right. a company like mine going to get a national presence? Well, let me tell you something. 18 months later, when I had 350 certified consultants, and you don't need 350 to do this, but we had somebody in every state of the, of the, of the country, every single state had a certified consultant. And now, no matter where somebody was, I could dispatch a certified consultant to their office, typically within hours, hmm. and get their problem solved. So this became a amazing gift to me as a, as a CEO and as a company owner, because I was able to very quickly create a sales channel. That was my third largest sales channel of everything I did in the company, because, you know, certified consultants love to sell. And since they were in the office anyway, they could do all your upgrades for you. They mm -hmm. could sell ancillary products. I mean, it was amazing what these guys did. And of course, they loved working for the company because the company provided leads. Right. So it was win, win, win across the board. And by the way, I charged them a lot of money for certification. So they were generating millions of dollars in certification fees and all of the, uh, all of the other things that went along with that. And they would come yearly to a symposium I would run here in Massachusetts. And, you know, sometimes we called it Lobster Fest because it was just so much fun. We do it in the summer and <laughs> have a blast, you know, and, and it, and it became a community of people who loved the company and we loved them. And, and, you know, so it was not, it was 20 years later that Josh Turner of Linked Selling asked if I would be willing to build something like that for him. Hmm. And I said, sure. What the heck? Why not? It sounds like fun. Let's do it. So I built it for him and it was an immediate success, immediately generated six figures in new brand new revenue. And that's without a product that was like just using what he already had and his existing customer list. We immediately generated six figures and that program will probably go on to generate over a million dollars in year two. So now it turns out that other people are asking me to do it, too. And just recently, you may have heard of this guy. His name is Jay Abraham. Yep. Jay anyway. asked if I would do it for him as well. And I said I would. So now I have some pretty amazing clients that I'm doing this for. And now the steps and processes are very repeatable. And now the results are very, very, very repeatable. So now what I'm able to do is I'm able to take a company who qualifies. And I'm able to get them a complete certification program built, launched, and monetized in 90 days or less. That's awesome. And that's what that's awesome. That's what I'm doing, and that's what I'm having fun with right now. That's awesome. So, again, yeah, and this is something that, like you say, they have to qualify. So a few of the things that people need in the first hand is they need to be doing about seven figures or above in revenue, about 800 to 1,000 existing clients with some sort of process or program or product or device that – that delivers a transformation or can deliver a high value benefit for the end client, right? It has to be high value. Obviously, whoever, whatever they're selling, it's got to be something that's a value. You want them to have in a volume that you can scoop some of those customers and help them feed them into the certification program. And then also they need to be doing something that's not custom because if it's custom work all the time, it's really hard to create a system out of that. Is that accurate? That, that is so accurate. And, and again, to make a point here, you know, we have coaching organizations, sales organizations, training organizations, software companies, SaaS companies, all of those people, all those types of companies qualify. People like Infusionsoft have utilized certification to basically put them on the map. Right. So 
Right. Yes. Infusionsoft is a huge user of that. We know Microsoft, Salesforce, Lead Pages. A lot of big companies are doing this sort of thing because, I mean, it works. It's almost like a type of referral program, except for instead of just referrals, you're actually creating a profit center out of these people. So Exactly. Exactly. So what does that process look like, Mitch? If somebody was listening to this, if they qualify already, if they're interested, what's the, what are the next steps? Probably the next steps are to go to mypowertribe.com, look over the material, and if, it, if you feel like you're a fit, then set up a time for us to talk, and I'll walk you through all of the steps that we would take for your own individual company. It's that simple. Got it. Okay, so if anyone here has been listening to that and they think that this is something that they'd like to explore and they want to get on the phone or and talk to Mitch or find out more, go to mypowertribe.com. I fully, fully endorse anything Mitch does. Obviously, just from listening to the last hour of us talking, you can tell that Mitch has been there, done that, kind of knows what he's doing and, and kind of gets to handpick clients as well. So I definitely think if you think you this is something that your company would benefit from, reach out and get in touch. Go to My Power Tribe, and it's singular, right? Not tribes. MyPowerTribe.com. Check that Correct. page out, and then and I guess kind of take it from there. So let's talk about the certification program a little bit. So because this is something I'm just interested in myself. Maybe someone's listening and they don't have the the size of the volume that they've got, but they think this might be something worth at least investigating or trying because what you said I think might have put a light bulb out for a lot of people. Like if they have someone that says, hey, anytime, just let me know, a customer that's willing to help out. Is there some – there are common mistakes people make when they try to implement this sort of thing? Oh, yes, they sure are. Let me tell you a quick story about how I almost crashed my company because <laughs> of making some dumb mistakes. So remember I told you a story about how I asked that client to go help another client. Right. And then I said, well, geez, why don't I just create a test? And I did. I created a test and I sent it out and I got a lot of people who passed it and I called them certified consultants. What I didn't realize is that while those people might have been able to pass a test, that they were, in effect, not going to be compatible with the company or with the group. So what I came to understand, and it took a while, and like I said, I almost crashed the company because of this is that we had sent a lot of broken, damaged people <laughs> out to client offices, and uh. it that they created quite a mess for themselves and for me. And so what I realized the missing ingredient was, was culture. Uh. And culture is, you know, far, it's a buzzword, I guess, but it's, it's so meaningful and so important when compared to a business model alone Without the culture, the business model is destined to fail. Hmm. And it's it's destined to fail because it's sort of like if you had a freeway with no lanes on it and people could just drive all over the place and there was no direction. That's what a business program without a culture is like. Yep. So once I understood what was going wrong and I had to literally interview Every single client who had a bad experience with my first round of certified consultants to truly understand how screwed up the experience was, when I truly understand all of that, I then went back and I built a culture document. And I built this document around understanding exactly what controls people wanted, needed, and were comfortable working within. So, mm. I mean... From control comes freedom. It's a very simple statement, but what it means is that by building a set of boundaries into a system, people are free to be creative and wander between them and be productive and happy inside the boundaries that you create. Mm -hmm. So if this is something you've ever thought of doing, by all means, think about the nature of the group as well as what it is you want them to do, mm -hmm. and that will take you long way to not making a mistake mm, 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 mm. culture is so important so 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 important i was tempted to go on the internet but i don't want to mess with my my connection to look up there's like seven time world strongest man gave a quote and he was you know he's like what i forget what it was but he was just like you just have to surround yourself with people that want to win like he's he's like i wouldn't there's no way i would have won all these championships if i had have tolerated people training with me that didn't show up every way to, every day to give their best 
And I really think like that's the whole you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That's because it becomes infectious. You can in, you people can infect you with their poor attitudes, their poor ideas, their poor philosophy, their poor habits and routines. So I think a culture, like you said, it's super important, especially if you have someone that's going to show up in front of your clients and they're going to represent your company and your values and what you stand for. You've been building this company for 10 years and you're just going to let someone show up and let them wear whatever they want to wear and, you know what I mean, chew gum and you know, be unshaven and all that. So I think that, that, that that's, you know, like you said, it's a simple statement, but I think it's really powerful. You know, it's another thing that I have done in the past is I've helped other coaching organizations fix their current company and their current coaching current coaching organization and i remember working with a client once and she called me up and said help 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 i really i really need some help here i said what's going on she says well you know we grew the company rather quickly and you know my brother-in-law said he knew somebody so we hired him as a coach and somebody else came along and we said hey you want to be a coach and we hired them as a coach so they never had a contract they never put anything in place in writing with these people. Turns mm -hmm. out one of them had literally stole all of her intellectual property and posted it on her own website as her own. Turns out that they were soliciting customers for other things while going on calls for their company. I mean, it was all this stuff going on. And what we basically did is we returned to basics. We said, OK, look, so let's start with a, a basically sound legal agreement that defines who owns what and what your role is. Mm. Then let's mm. create some guidelines so that people know what they can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And it took about a month. But in the course of that month, we completely restructured her program, put them on the map, and they have been doing nothing but growing ever since. Mm -mm -mm. I think that's actually huge. I actually know people who have had that. I know a guy that was a speaker and – he had a, he, this guy was, a, I've seen, this guy was a closer, like from the stage, he closed. I saw him sell, uh, he was the second last speaker on a three day event and his product competed with the pro, the main offer being made for the entire three days by the people who organized the event. And in a, in a 60 minute spot, he cleared $75,000 out of that room. And I think that was more than the guys made their three days trying to pitch their own product. And he did a traveling tour and he found out after being in business for three years, his head sales lady had two ATM or two debit terminals every time at the back of the room. And she would swipe it for herself and oh. send those clients to her own team and she'd been doing this for years. And like, what are you going to do at that point? It's been three years. Just under his oh, nose. Anyways, yeah. anyways, that's just, just, anyways, there's a lot of, man, some of those mistakes are <laughs> really painful. They're really expensive. I love what you they said are. about with the testing, how you hired trained professionals. You did nine months of testing, but you brought in people who knew what they were doing, that were professionals at it, that had been there, done that. And so for you, by month nine, you had a flawless reliable dependable system that you could trust and base your business on as well so that's excellent that's excellent that's that's a, even on its own is a great place for people to start i think those are two big things for people to consider even if like they're not for anything that you're doing in a company just even having a sales rep or having someone deliver a service it doesn't even have to be a certification program for your clients i think just the culture and and also making sure you're protecting yourself in those respects are just really i mean those are just really painful mistakes to learn the hard way yourself i so agree so mitch i appreciate the time that you share with us today i feel like we've covered so much this call is definitely worth listening to a couple of times over we talked about just I, I, taking measured results talked about failing fast about not quitting about testing small scaling big fast once you have it about enjoying yourself on the process about about paying for professional help where it makes sense because to not is way more expensive in the long run the mistakes you make that the yeah just straight up as i said and then we also talked about for anyone that's looking to set up some any sort of certification program in their company how this could be an entirely new income stream for their business be a way to turn customers not just into sources of referrals but profit centers in and of themselves to help increase lifetime value customer value how to upsell into existing other products and just keep safe sales, save customers that are, are going delinquent as is. 
So again, if, if any of you want to, I mean, there are some requirements. If you do want to work with Mitch, obviously he's not just available for anybody and anybody, everybody. But if you do have 800 to 1,000 customers right now, if you are running around to seven figures in revenue, if you have a process that's repeatable and can be taught to others to who can generate the same results, if it's a process, a program, a product, or a device that delivers a transformation or a high value benefit to your client, it may be worth you going to mypowertribe.com, checking that out, and getting in touch with Mitch as he has something of his own that's obviously worked well enough that the, I mean, Tony Robbins, Chet Holmes, some of the biggest, brightest names in the in the business and in the world trust him and and work closely with him. So if you would like to join the roster of people, I highly recommend you go check out mypowertribe.com. See if you qualify and see if you've got something that Mitch thinks he can help you out with in your business. And obviously, just from hanging out with the two of us for this past hour, you, you it's very obvious he has a ton of value to give. Mitch, I, I so appreciate your time. You've been such a generous and, and, and wonderful friend for me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be able to just share your wisdom with my audience. Is there anything I haven't asked you in the last hour that you I should have asked you or anything else that you would like to share? I just want to make, make a point here because I know you have a lot of listeners at a lot of different stages. If anybody has a question about anything we talked about, uh, would it be okay if I invite them to reach yeah, out and just yeah, by all means. Okay. So all you got to do is just send me an email at mitchrusso at gmail.com, M-I-T-C-H-R-U-S-S-O at gmail. And I don't, you know, I don't care what stage business you're in. If you have a question, if you want a clarification, if there's anything at all that we talked about that sparks an idea that you'd like to chat about or or share with me, I want to hear about it. I want to hear from you. That's awesome. That's so awesome. That's a huge opportunity. I, I, I hope the listeners, again, hope first, I hope you have clear questions or good questions. Listen to this call again. Make sure that you, you get the, the juice from this. And then if you are going to contact Mitch, it's M-I-T-C-H-R-U-S-S-O at gmail.com. Or you can check out mypowertribe.com. There's also mitchrusso.com and mitchrussotravels.com to take a look at some of his amazing photographs, which I am just, I think they're amazing. I, I don't even know how much time you'd go into preparation for them, but the few seconds that I look at them, it's, they're, they're always great. So it so doesn't surprise thank me you. you won some awards. So yeah. So Mitch, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I value as a friend. And again, thank you for coming and sharing with the listeners and thank you. My pleasure, Daryl. Talk to you again soon, I hope. You've reached the end of our interview. Now first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.